Rescue work is very dangerous for first responders. Often it puts their lives at risk to save yours. So Sparks firefighters train to keep rescue skills sharp. Hello and welcome to Spotlight on Sparks. I'm your host, Adam Mayberry. In the next half hour, we'll take you behind the scenes in Ward 1, and we'll take you on the scene of job number one, and that's public safety. This emergency exercise drill feels very real from the bottom of a 10-foot deep, dirty ditch. This is, this is one of the disciplines that our technical rescue team um, takes part in is trench rescue. We also do um, structural collapse rescue, high angle rescue, low angle rescue, um, and confined space rescue. The first challenge for Sparks Fire Department's technical rescue team is how to work the site without making things any worse. Yes, yeah, so and we, what we do is we build shoring um, that's going to keep the walls from collapsing in, and we do that from the top down. Um, so as, as we go into the trench, we're pressurizing against the side of the, of the trench. Um, until we can get down to the victim and get our people on the ground and actually dig, dig in the person out. Listen as the instructor talks about stabilizing the trench sidewalls. That's going to be important. So where can I find four by fours? What else can I use? Shoring and stabilizing walls is just half the job. There's still an endangered citizen to rescue. About 60% of trenches that have had a collapse in them will have another collapse. So if we if we just throw a ladder in there and rush in to rescue somebody, then uh, we, we're taking the chance of, of everybody not going home, and that's not what we want to do. So um, we need to do it safely and make sure that we get the people out as expeditiously as we can. Sparks Fire wasn't the only local agency to benefit from the day's training. The Sparks Community Services Department and the Truckee Meadows Fire Protection District also participated in the advanced training event. We have not had a trench class in several years due to budget constraints, um, but we we're, were able to, to put some money aside and, and get one on this year. We've got several members of the technical rescue team who have not been through a trench class, so it's, it's fairly imperative. A former member of the technical response team is moving on to new challenges. Tom Garrison, has had a long and varied career with the city's fire department and is now the new fire chief for the city of Sparks. I've been with the Sparks Fire Department for 26 years. I got hired in July of 1987. I've been in the Truckee Meadows all my life. I moved here in 1961 and I lived on Moana Lane, which at that time was the edge of town. Okay, so I've seen this town you know, grow up from very, very small beginnings to the size it is today. Um, I went to school here. I went to school at Anderson Elementary, and then I moved out to the North Valleys and went to Lemon Valley Elementary. Trainer Junior High School, it was called Junior High School then, uh, Hug High School, and then I went to UNR and, and graduated with a degree in uh, education, elementary education as well as secondary education, and started teaching and, and coaching. Um, taught in Fernley High School and then I ended up being a head basketball coach at Minogue High School for a year and, and decided to leave teaching and didn't know where my next move was going to be. It was, uh, it was a, a, probably an easy transition. Um, it's, it's very, very similar even though when you're coaching you, you lose games. You know, when you, when you lose games in the fire service it's a lot more serious. Okay. I was out of education and, and kind of bouncing around jobs and not really knowing what I was going to do with my future. And I was sitting at the intersection right over here at, at Rock and, and uh, Victorian and a fire truck dro drove by and the person driving the fire truck was a guy I used to compete against in, in high school and I thought, Gary's driving a fire truck, that, that looks so exciting and I thought, maybe I'll give that a try. And a little while later, they had an application process, and I applied and took the test, and, you know, I guess it was meant to be. Well, I started when I was 30 years old, so I was relatively old 
for a rookie firefighter. Very intimidated, uh, very nervous about what I was going to be doing. Well, when I, st when I started, um, I was uh, hired with a group of 12, which at that time was the largest single hiring in the, the history of the Sparks Fire Department. And I was hired because they were opening Fire Station 3 on, on East Greg Street. Um, so at that time, there were, there were two fire stations in the city of Sparks, uh, this station here on Victorian and the one on Bering. Uh, there were, I think, three fire engines with three person on each fire engine and one truck company with two people. So really we almost, not quite doubled, but almost a third more people uh, were, we, we expanded the staffing by almost a third just with our hiring. I spent seven years as a firefighter and then got promoted to an operator. Um, I spent a year doing that, which actually was the most fun job in the fire department, driving the fire trucks is, is just a, a blast. Um, but then uh, a year later, promoted to captain. And I spent 12 years as a captain before deciding to change direction a little bit and, and go into training. I spent a couple years in training and then um, promoted to a division chief. I spent four years as a division chief and then this job came open and I, I think I enjoy the challenge. Um, every day is different. Um, there's no real rule book for leadership positions. There's no procedure manual. It's more common sense, doing what's right, um, treating people how you would want to be treated. I can remember when um, the uh, edge of town was, you know, Reed High School, and you know, none of the north, uh, north, you know. Wingfield Springs or you know Los Altos area, none of that was there. So I, I remember when that was developed and think, wow, this is this is really going to stretch us. And you know we we've grown and tried to keep pace with the the needs and the risks in the community. As new areas developed, um, we work with developers to get fire stations built. Um, as soon as so many houses were built, you know they had a requirement to to build fire stations, and then we had the challenge to staff them. Um, and at that time, the, the city was experiencing, you know, uh, just this great acceleration of growth and, and within the city and budgets were good and we were able to staff and, and buy fire trucks and, and, and fill fire stations with fire trucks. Our staffing level five years ago, 2008, um, we had four person per staffing across the board and we have since reduced to three person staffing across the board. Uh, that was a decision made by the city and fire department staff to make sure that we could still provide service to 95% of our call volume. We really believe that getting there fast, even with um, less numbers, is more effective than not having or closing down a fire station. My vision is to make sure that the fire department is um, designed to meet the needs of the community and also the risk of the community. Um, right now, um, probably my biggest challenge is making sure that not only is do I have staffing to meet our most common or frequent call volume, which are EMS calls, which only need you know, one engine company, but on the other end of the extreme, I have to meet those structure fires that need you know 15 or more people. Okay, so there's always a challenge to try to design a staffing model that covers both extremes. We have, we have active mutual aid agreements with both Truckee Metals and Reno and active automatic aid agreements. There are areas in our city that, that we need assistance um, and we have areas in our city, city that are county pockets and they need our assistance so it's a mutually beneficial. I think that you know we've done a, a great job for the community. We we promise that we'll be there within six minutes, and 70% of the time we meet that promise. We've never let people down when they call us for help. We show up, and we show up quickly. We show up with uh, skilled personnel. We show up with great equipment, and we show up with compassion and caring for you know taking care of the citizens.
Christmas time has always been special in the city of Sparks. In 2013, the city received its final Christmas tree from its sister city, Garibaldi, Oregon. In 2014 and beyond, the city and its residents will experience a new live tree that'll stand on Victorian Square for generations to come. The Christmas tree traveled almost 600 miles from Sparks' sister city in Garibaldi, Oregon. It's a gift from their city to our city. Me and Dave Stein Sr. goes out and looks for a tree for a day or two before, a week or two before, and uh, we probably look at thousands of trees before we find one that's full enough all the way around and straight. Sister cities between Garibaldi and the city of Sparks started some close to 30 years ago. It actually started with the city of Reno as a lot of good things that started in a conversation in a bar between a couple of people and the next thing you know there was city of Reno had a tree being delivered uh, the following week to Fort Christmas and in the following year the city of Garibaldi sent two Christmas trees, one for Sparks, one for Reno and Reno decided not to carry on the, uh, their relationship with the city of Sparks did. It's been going on for close to 30 years um, and the, the city has taken and sends uh, a couple people on up for their festival once a year and then they try to send as many people as they can down for hometown Christmas parade and spend three or four days in the city of Sparks and uh, kind of exchange of ideas and things how to increase tourism. Yeah, I think it's sad, uh, you know, after 28 years, but like I said, you know, if they feel it's ran its course and I think the participation, you know, each year's got a little bit less. I'm trying to get people from the Oregon coast, all up and down the Oregon coast to come and spend the weekend in the city of Sparks. It's a big deal. It, it, it has worked for a long time. Many of the tree's handmade decorations were created by children participating in the City of Sparks youth programs. Now it's time to spotlight our Sparks City Council member. So join me for a conversation with Julia Ratty, representing the city's Ward 1. Well, Councilman Ratty, thank you for coming on the program. I want to ask you a little bit about your background in Sparks and why you decided to stay here. Okay. Well, I was born and raised in Sparks. I went to Robert Mitchell Elementary School, then I went to Dilworth, and then I went to Reed, and of course stayed here and went to UNR. And um, I've stayed because I've just continued to have fabulous opportunities that have kept me connected to my community. Um, I've always been really interested in giving back and making my community a better place, and I just keep getting the opportunity to do that, so there's been no reason to leave. Well, tell me a little bit about your family. Well, um, mom and dad, Bob and Jan, um, I have a brother named Keith. I am married to husband James, and of course we have Gus the Wonder Dog, who keeps us company. Um, my dad is native Nevadan. He grew up in Bango, Nevada, which not very many people have heard of. Bango is actually, was actually a little railroad town outside of Hazen. Um, and so, you know, Nevada is a big part of our life, and uh, we love being here. Well, so on that note, why do you enjoy living in Sparks? And what do you tell other people who aren't aware of Sparks about living in Sparks? You know, I, for me, I love living in Sparks, and, and probably even more importantly with Ward 1, I love being down in the core of Sparks. I love that I can get on my bike and ride down to Victorian Square and enjoy all of the special events. I love that I can hang out at the Great Basin Brewery on the patio during the summer and listen to live music. Um, I love that there's always something going down, going on downtown, but at the same time, it's all very accessible. It's um, you know family friendly. It is uh, something always going on, and um, it's just a great place to live. And and you live and represent uh, Ward One, although you're voted uh, by all the residents uh, during the general the general election. But uh, your ward is is probably one of the the older wards, and perhaps more diverse sports in the city. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, absolutely, and I think that's part of the reason I've stayed too. I really like the older parts of the city that have more character. I love the, the mid-century houses with the hardwood floors and the plaster walls and everything that comes along with that. And so certainly that's what's kept uh, my husband and I uh, busy in Sparks. We uh, Our first house was a brick house with the hardwood floors and we did, did some upgrades there. And then about three years ago, we bought another one and um, 
got to, it was in kind of rough shape and got to bring it back to life. And I really do like seeing those older parts of a city brought back to life. So that certainly is um, an exciting part of Ward 1. And diversity, I love the diversity of downtown. I'm, I'm much more interested in being someplace where um, you don't have to drive as much, where there's lots of different kinds of people, um, where every house doesn't look exactly alike. I mean, sure. that, that's the exciting and fun part for me. Well, now you're in your, uh, you're going into your second term. Uh, you were re-elected in 2012. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about why you decided to run for city council in the first place. Well, actually, um, that, that goes very m back much to what we were talking about. I, uh, when I decided to run for office was a very different time, just you know, to, to put it in perspective. Sure. The economy was booming. Um, we were expanding out into Spanish Springs and at an incredibly rapid pace. The Legends Project was just starting to come out of the ground. And I saw from the outside, I saw all the time and energy going into the new parts of the city, the Legends Project or Spanish Springs. But I didn't see what was happening around neighborhood revitalization and the older parts of the city. And that, that's something that I, I particularly am passionate about. So that's really why I ran for office when I decided that, you know, I've always worked in nonprofits and I've worked in other different, in other ways to, to make my community a better place. But when I looked around for, well, if I wanted to get involved in local government, what would be the right match for me? It was local government because that's where you really can make a difference at the neighborhood level. That's what I was interested in. So, uh, and you know, there are a lot of uh, thorns uh, in between the single rows on the mm -hmm. city council. You're the only, uh, <laughs> you're the only woman on the city council currently. Mm -hmm. So what kind of dynamics and perspective that does that bring to you? Is there any, any thoughts that you could share with us? Well, you know, I think there's diversity. It's, there's gender, there's age to a certain extent. Sure. Um, True. There's perhaps life philosophy even in some <laughs> cases. Um, but I do think it's important that we have people from all different backgrounds involved in local government. I think that a representative, a representative democracy is just that, that, that you do get people with different backgrounds and different passions. And my passions are definitely different than some of the other members of the council. I think um, where we're really lucky in Sparks is that as a governing body, I think we've developed some really strong relationships and we work well together even though we do have different priorities and we do have different beliefs on some things. We do all seem to keep the city front and first and foremost in our attention and time. And so I think that that's been a pleasure. Certainly, um, you know, from the time I decided to run when the economy was booming until um, when I got elected, when the bottom had just fallen out of the housing market and we were making some pretty dramatic decisions about our budget, um, Things changed yeah. quite a bit, and it really then became all about, well, what's the most important? What has, to, what do we have to make sure that we save as a foundation so that at some point when the economy turns around, we can make sure that we are back to making forward progress as a city. And, you know, I'm proud of the work that we've done in the city of Sparks over the last uh, five years to make sure that we protected what was important, um, and we did, it, we did it pretty well. You can talk to your city representatives through our website. But now there's a new tool to reach out and get things done. Want to ask a question, express a concern, or report a problem? A new and powerful program called Spark Citizens Request is available both through our website and on most mobile devices via the city's official app. We'll click on this new request here at the top of the page. And you will enter the location of the issue or concern that you're addressing. So for today, I'm going to say corner of Prater and Pyramid. And then you will go to the drop down of selecting a service type. Spark Citizens Request creates a transparent, ongoing conversation string between you and your city on one particular issue. I'm making it easier for citizens to get their issues and concerns reported. Also be able to track the progress and make sure that those are resolved. And with the downsizing of staffing, the quick access that the staff have via email to get these resolved. For example, if you report a pothole or some graffiti, you will be able to track your report as it moves through city departments. You can also upload a photo from your computer or your mobile device. So I'm gonna add, go ahead and add the photo. You will see what city staff does to respond and when. Anytime the staff comment on the issue or the concern, they will get an email notifying them of that comment up to resolution. And you will see when repair work is scheduled and performed. By connecting people directly and transparently to the appropriate city staff, Spark Citizens Requests will turn public inquiries and service requests 
into real-world community improvements. There could be a concern for overgrown weeds, as an example, and that would go to our zoning and or maintenance areas, so they would make sure that it's not a dormant location, and if it is, that would be a zoning issue. And we could send our maintenance crews out there as well and clean up those areas. And now, back to our visit with Councilwoman Julia Raddy. Let's hear more about the goals for historic downtown's future. So in your role as a city councilwoman, uh, you also serve on a variety of, of boards. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about those roles and, and, and the importance of, of, of those roles. Well, certainly um, the District Board of Health is uh, one that I'm particularly passionate about. Um, you know, caring about, and again, you, you sort of get the theme here, I'm you're really interested in, in the things that strengthen our community. And, and, and you serve on that board because you're on the city council, right? I mean, Absolutely. It's, I'm, I'm the one uh, member of the city council appointed to the District Board of Health. Okay. Um, of course, the District Board of Health deals with everything that has to do with public health. So it could be um, immunizations, it could be uh, dealing with the obesity epidemic, it could be uh, making sure that our quality of air is good. I mean, it's a very broad look at public health. Um, making sure that um, health services are available to low-income families and you know those are again are things that are critical to our quality of life they're critical to make sure that um, those among us who need a little extra hand get that extra hand and so I've certainly been excited about being on that board I'm also the vice chair of the redevelopment um, agency sure. which is um, been again an interesting time to serve there hasn't been a lot of resources to do significant work in redevelopment so it's been a lot of retrenching refocusing making sure that we know what our priorities are in redevelopment um, so th those are two of the big ones my, probably another one of my favorites is I'm on the I'm the council member appointed to the Parks and Recreation Commission and it's so you know obviously taking good care of our parks and recreation and outdoor activities is um, so important to the quality of life not just you know in the urban core but throughout the entire city and there have been some great things that have happened on the Parks and Recreation Commission Commission um, one of my favorite is the opening of Whittakin Park and that open space mm -hmm. and, and making sure that that open space is protected um, so you know excellent the boards and commissions certainly add um, an opportunity to focus on areas that I'm passionate about. Are there any key accomplishments that you could share with us that, that come to your mind over the last four plus years and maybe some goals that you have in your mind for the next uh, foreseeable future? It's, it's an interesting peri time period to talk about accomplishments, isn't it? Because, um, of course, with the budget a challenge, right? plummeting the way it was, I do think that um, you talked a little bit about how I'm a little bit different than some of the other council members, and so I do think that one of my most important accomplishments has been been making sure that there are diverse viewpoints when we are talking about the budget process or, or any other issue for that matter. That there is another side to the story sometimes, um, and then I think um, making sure that the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, as a whole, and, and, and not just Parks and Recreation, but all of the quality of life elements in the city budget. Um, didn't, we didn't lose focus on those when times were really tough. Um, public safety is incredibly important, and I'm proud of the public safety agencies that we have here in the city of Sparks, but I always felt it was my role to remind people that um, it's great that we keep people safe, but if they're safe and they don't have any quality of life beyond that, then then what? And so, really making sure that you know all of the part, all of the departments had a voice during the budget process was important for me. Um, I think I think those are probably the big things. And while being a council person is a, a part-time job, although it sure doesn't seem like it. You do have a real full-time job as well. I do. So tell us a little bit about what you do um, when you're not uh, a, a member of the city council. I have the best job in the world. I am, I am the CEO of the Girl Scouts of the Sierra Nevada, right. which means that I run, we happen to be the fourth smallest council in the nation in terms of the number of girls, but we are the 10th largest in terms of the geography that we cover. So that's 96,000 square miles. So I'm in charge of Girl Scouting all the way up to the Oregon border, out to the Utah border, out to Quincy, California, and down to Bishop, California. So it's a, well, a huge, no yeah, it's a huge territory. Um, and uh, you know, the two go together particularly well, I think, because it's my job. My day job is developing the next generation of women leaders. And so I think about that a lot when I'm serving on the city council. About am I setting an example that I want a generation of girls to follow in terms of leadership? And so I try to be particularly thoughtful about. What, not just um, what I get accomplished, but how I lead, because the girls are watching. And 
Um, part of what I get to do in my city council job is to be a role model for 4,500 girls who are learning leadership skills every day, helped along by 2,000 fabulous volunteers who um, put a lot of time and energy volunteering and, and helping those girls to develop into their best and fullest potential. So I love it. That's great. I, I really appreciate your, uh, your example. I appreciate your leadership and I appreciate your service and thank you for coming on the program. You bet. Thanks, Adam. And that's all the time we have for this installment of Spotlight on Sparks. Make sure you follow us on Facebook and Twitter and log on to cityofsparks.us for more information. Thank you for watching and we leave you with images of the Sparks hometown Christmas festivities. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Do you know it? Just like the ones I used to know Where the treetops glisten And children listen To hear sleigh bells in the snow